Good afternoon for everyone. I'm Anja Nygren, Professor of Global Development Studies at the University of Helsinki, Finland. It's my great pleasure to open this roundtable discussion on agrarian extractivism or agro-extractivism. We have here a group of well-known scholars sharing their recent ideas on how to define extractivism and agro-extractivism. As we know, extractivism has often been defined as an overextension of natural resource exploitation with attendant uh, mindsets, politics, and practices. But is this definition still valid? And is it ample enough? We also know that there are many similarities and differences in different types or so-called sectors of extractivism, such as oil and natural gas extraction, mining, agricultural and tree plantations, and so on. But what are these key similarities and differences? While we are supporting efforts to extend the concept of extractivism, we also recognize that there might be a risk if we ex expand it too much so that the concept then loses its explanatory explanatory power. Today, we have a wonderful group, a wonderful opportunity to listen to these distinguished scholars who kindly share their ideas of how to conceptualize extractivism and agro-extractivism. The facilitator of this, of this roundtable discussion is Professor Markus Kröger in Global Development Studies, University of Helsinki. Then we have three highly prestigious speakers. First, Sergio Sauer, professor at the University of Brazil. Alberto Alonso Frajedas, a researcher from the University of Utrecht, Utrecht the Netherlands. And then Sana Hokkanen, PhD researcher in global development, development studies at the University of Helsinki. All of these scholars have been working on extractivism for a long time. They have incredible knowledge and expertise on conceptualization of extractivism and agro extractivism and on different types of extract extractivism. I'm sure we will all really enjoy this inspiring discussion. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Anya. Um, so yes, welcome everybody to this seminar. The idea of this seminar is to engage more in depth with the definition of extractivism and especially agro-extractivism. We have four guests list here, which you can find also at the website. Uh, and we will go through them in order. And then the speakers will have time to respond to all of the, all of the guests. After that, we will have uh, comments and this, uh, by our discussions, Barry Gills and uh, Franklin Obeng Odu, <clears throat> after which we open the floor for any discussions from the audience. And please be, feel free to use the chat uh, also, so we can collect the guesses. And there will be a moment towards the end of the uh, of the <clears throat> seminar after discussions in English to also make guesses in Spanish. We have simultaneous translation. Um, so we could start with the first guesson. What should be included in the definition of extractivism, and what should not? So maybe if you. Sergio Sauer would start first, and then Alberto can continue, and after that, Sana. Uh, 
Thank you, Marcus. Uh, also, Professor Anya, your kind words give us a lot of responsibility in terms of, you know, looking or saying something smart. Um, in terms of uh, what should be included, I would say uh, one of the, the key things is to see extraction or extractivism as a system in general terms. Uh, and then at least uh, four or five uh, different aspects or components should be uh, part of that system. One is monopoly or, or control of natural resources, right? By a company, by, uh, by a company, by uh, uh, government, state, but, you know, control in a sense of monopoly. Um, second, most of the time, it's uh, productive activity. I'll come back to that later. But it's a relation between a human activity and uh, exploitation or uh, expropriation of natural resource to a level that is uh, leads to depletion or exhaustion. Okay, so that would be so. Then you know, is rely on on using extracting natural resources, but not in a, in a, let's say, a creative world, but on a destructive uh, perspective. And uh, third, because it's system based on control and monopoly, it could be in, in political terms or a uh, exploration or dependency between core and periphery, like, for example, extracting uh, from a local uh, place to appropriate globally by um, a, a multinational company or a say, let's say a developed country and so on. And the fourth, to not to, to extend too much, uh, those as a system, uh, it should uh, or it leaves behind as a let's say main consequence a a in one way a global wealth accumulation and whether uh, can be local or national or regional empower, uh, impoverishment or say poverty. So one of the greatest consequence in let's say, social terms, poverty in natural or uh, nature's um, logic, a depletion. That would be kind of four or five um, aspects to say this uh, is a um, extractivism as a system for now. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Professor Anya Nigren, uh, Dr. Barry Gills, Professor, it doesn't go faster, but I can go closer. Yeah. yeah. Um, Professor, thank you. I'm Professor Marcus Kruger for having uh, me and us here. It's a pleasure uh, to join this uh, group and, and discussion today. If I may, Marcus, I would like to, before going directly to the question, and of course, uh, yeah, taking into consideration that those who are joining us today are aware of the discussions on strategies, but still I would like to, yeah, ground a little bit my, my uh, uh, quick question to this first. Um, uh, uh, or my, my quick answer to this first question. 530 years since Christopher Columbus annexed uh, to the crown of Castile what today is Dominican Republic and uh, thus kicking the uh, beginning of uh, uh, extractive or extractivist colonialism, the notion of extractivism regains momentum, right, in recent times, uh, mainly, in my opinion, uh, due to two dynamics. One is the commodity boom at the turn of the 21st century, uh, and the other is still ongoing and is this uh, major contradiction in current efforts to decarbonize our societies. And this is that uh, the mainstream efforts to achieve uh, climate neutrality are still highly intensive in natural resources. So then, yeah, we have again discussions on extractivism. Uh, 
and of particular relevance to this repositioning of the discussion of extractivism in the political and scholarly agenda is the work of the so-called uh, Latin American post-development school, right? One of its main uh, authors, Eduardo Gudinas, defines conventional extractivism to start with right, one accepted definition already 12 years ago that uh, Eduardo Gudinas put forward his notion of extractivism as, and I'm quoting, activities which remove great quantities of natural resources that are not then processed or are done, done so in a limited fashion and that leave a country as exports, right? Unprocessed raw commodities for export. This is a definition endorsed by Alberto Acosta and Maristela Svampa, also key post-development uh, authors. Although the latter, uh, Svampa qualifies Gudina's definition by arguing that extractivism involves, and I quote, the expansion of frontiers to territories that were formerly considered unproductive, right? So indeed, contributions by the post-development school authors are uh, uh, rich and meaningful. Uh, but uh, whereas the bulk of attention has been devoted to the analysis of the new extractivism performance as a political project or the ecological terms of exchange among countries and the social metabolism of extraction, the social relations of production uh, 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 underpinning contemporary resource extractivism on an everyday life basis have received lesser and or narrower attention. Uh, thus, uh, in my opinion, despite repeated calls by key authors against the absolutization and the historicization of extractivism as an analytical category, much of the literature on new extractivism conceals more than it reveals about the various trajectories, geographical unevenness, and ecologically and socially differentiated outcomes of resource extractivism. To be clear, the history of natural resource extraction for social reproductive purposes is as old as that as humanity. Different modes and forms of commodity uh, uh, production rely on natural resource extractivism to a greater or lesser extent. Thus, to me, the question that remains is how to qualify uh, an account for the intensity of extractiveness of a mode or a form of production, which ranges, following Gudinas, from indispensable to predatory extractivism, right? We cannot avoid extractivism as human beings. For Gudinas, there are three necessary and simultaneous conditions for predatory resource extractivism to be uh, 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 the case, including, and I quote, large scale of extraction, limited processing, and export destination. To me, this may or may not be uh, part of the equation. What really matters is that these or any other context uh, uh, relevant conditions do not take place in a social and ecological vacuum. Rather, they drive and express concrete social relations in a specific socio-ecological formation within a particular uh, uh, time span and in the context of broader uh, world historical conjecture. This said, uh, going straight now uh, uh, to my take on this question is, uh, uh, to me, there are three main sets of criteria that are important to qualify this resource extractiveness uh, uh, of a form or mode of production, right? And thus, that, that should be included in a definition or in an understanding of extractivism. The first set includes criteria, indeed, for the analysis of the social metabolism of resource extraction, right? Or the ways in which uh, 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 those, uh, the, the, the extractivist activity organize its exchanges of uh, energy and materials with nature. The second set focuses on labor and this is key to me, right? This focus on labor and includes three specific criteria. The first relates to the implications of resource extractivism for jobs, right? For employment, including 
in the extractivist activity and in the broader economy, and including what the extractivist activity brings and what was there before. The second labor criteria investigates whose paid labor is mobilized and organized in which ways, including wages and labor conditions for uh, uh, the production of commodities. And the third aspect concerns whether, how, and the extent to which uh, resource extractivism relies on the appropriation of neither higher nor paid labor, usually family labor, but not limited to uh, family labor. And finally, my third set of criteria uh, examines who controls what flows of capital in the production of uh, uh, extractivist commodities, other than those amounting to wages, right? That are supposed to be controlled by workers. Thus, it includes criteria for the analysis of, once again, whether, how, and the extent to which lands, ground rent, financial interests, royalties from intellectual property rights, payments for environmental services, and state subsidies are crafted, extracted, and appropriated by non-direct producers, right? So these three aspects of uh, uh, bringing together uh, very briefly the contradictions between capital and nature, capital and labor, and capital and social reproduction. this close enough? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me in the panel discussion. I feel not close enough. I have to go close. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. So yeah, thank you so much for having me in the discussion. Uh, I totally feel like a awkward younger sibling getting to play with the dope uh, older siblings. And, and yeah, I hope I don't break the play. But I think uh, my own approach to extractivism in general is from the point of view of, of this multi-species uh, multi thinking and political ontology. So while building on the kind of already discussed uh, conceptualizations and kind of like the, the dominant literature uh, from political ontological point of view, extractivism becomes to uh, see oh, it, 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 it is beyond these kind of apparent features of what, what we talked about already of a mode of production, a modality of, of accumulation, or or a kind of way of way of uh, organizing economic systems. But um, so it's not a political project. It's not just a feature of economic system, or even just a set of practices. But rather, like fundamentally, what extractivism is is a way of organizing life of land, of bodies, of labor, both human and non-human, or other than human. So you could say that extractivism is. Uh, one of the main ways currently how capitalism manifests itself materially in the web of life, uh, even though extractivism, of course, is not solely unique to, to capitalism or, or a character, characteristic only of, of that as a system. Uh, so from this point of view, extractivism is very fundamentally about existences of organizing, erasing, distorting existences and kind of assemblages of existences. And... Uh, narrowing the possibility of, of different forms of being in the world. So this therefore kind of opens up the possibility to study extractivism in, in these kind of different scales, different intensities, and beyond these, these uh, traditional core periphery kind of state-centered analysis. Um, and yeah, like to continue, okay, my brain uh, goes away. Okay, so, but yeah, from therefore, from this point of view, what then kind of is included in extractivism kind of comes to uh, become guided by this deeper understanding of the foundational fabric of uh, and foundational principles of the world system and kind of like the global crisis at, at play. So where we're, what we're faced with is this more, more like this fundamental commodification of all life on all different scales, different intensities. And this is then manifesting itself in these kinds of different uh, forms of extractivism and what, what, uh... okay. Yeah. Apparently I'm talking too fast for the interpreters. I'm so sorry for you, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so from, from this point of view, then what is included in extractivism is uh, 
from the traditional kind of natural resources focus of, of mining uh, all the way to neo-extractivism, so agro-extractivism and including, for example, soil extractivism that I'm working on right now to also issues like labor extractivism, where it's our energies and our bodies that are being extracted and depleted and, and kind of uh, yeah, damage to things then like data extractivism, where it's our social worlds and attention spans and identities that get fragmented and degraded and, and depleted. And of course, I'm not saying that all of these different types of extractivisms are the same or that they would have the same gravity in the web of life, but all of these kind of open up different aspects of this logic, these principles, this kind of guiding system of extractivism and that are that are founded on these these dynamics of drain and depletion and 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 degradation and i think that that in a way then opens up a more nuanced understanding also of the colonialities behind extractivism and that's why i also kind of love these newer descriptions of of extractivism through words such as that kind of like distort uh, disrupt the the classical conventional understandings of extractivism, for example, in the political economic literature. And some of these words are, for example, coming from Alberto Life Purge in the in the uh, context of agro extractivism in Guatemala, or what Marcus has been talking about, these kind of violent existential redistributions, or, or what uh, Justin Jacobsen and Alexander Dunlap have been talking about as extractivism as this uh, world eating, because these are what they fundamentally are. And I think to kind of conclude, I, I would also argue that while thinking about these definitions of extractivism and what is included in them, it's not that, that there would be some groundbreaking differences in the definitions or the conceptualizations, but rather that all of these different approaches open up some, some aspects of what extractivism is, how it manifests itself in the, in the world today, and how this kind of logic is intertwined and entangled in so much of the reality and normality that we know now in physical landscapes, in our worlds, in our lived experiences, and has these kind of life-altering effects on so many different scales. And yeah, that's my maybe take from that. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. So we have three very robust explanations on what should be included in the definition of extractivism and what should not and please we can return to this issue later on in the discussions but maybe we could now follow more closely to the definition of acro extractivism so how are acro extractivism defined and how should they be defined there's a, a new book called agrarian extractivism in latin america uh, edited by, by Alberto Pradejas and Ben McKay and then others. And there's contributions, for example, by Sergio and I co-authored an article there or, or chapter there on forestry extractivism in Uruguay with Maria Enstrom Fuentes. But yeah, there's this new, new literature also on these different types of extractivism depending on the sectors and so on. So in the agricultural sphere, how would you then define agro-extractivism in relation to the earlier other kind of extractivism. This uh, we can follow the same order, Sergio first, and then Alberto, and then then Sana. And please speak slowly so that the interpreters can follow. <clears throat> Thank you, Marcus. Uh, to ask us to to speak slowly always is a tricky thing because you have to be fast and slow. Okay, so <laughs> that's probably our job as, as scholars to try to explain theoretically something that's happening. But um, I think it's a, it's a very important question uh, moving from, let's say, being talking here, a um, general concept of extractivism to like you know, uh, agrarian extractivism or agro-extractivism or... Uh, some was already coining others like green extractivism and data extractivism, but sticking to what I understand a bit, uh, it one one aspect that I would say, as agorists say, agrarian extractivism brings land into the picture. That's that's the key. I will come back to that later. But just like Alberto did, there's one step back. Uh, for those who are not, you know, so so much into the the the, the, the 
agriculture and agrarian discussions. Uh, in after Second World War, um, you know, uh, this so-called Green Revolution comes in, new technology, tractors, um, um, uh, uh, hybrid seeds, uh, a lot of chemicals, pesticides, and so on. And um, a lot of us um, kind of define that as the industrialization of agriculture. And behind that concept has two kind of understanding. One is that even under capitalism, industry is creative, right? So it's, it's kind of ontological concept that, you know, even, even exploiting nature, even exploiting people, lives, and, uh, but create something, you know, transform a piece, uh, some materials in a computer or creating something. So then the idea of uh, industrialization agriculture uh, that has this concept, it's, uh, you know, it's cultivating things, uh, producing food, uh, producing, you know, a uh, way of living in, ter in terms of feeding us with the energy. So that's one, one thing. And another is that everything that not, doesn't fit in that is industrialization of agriculture is um, traditional, not so productive, uh, productivity is not so good. Uh, like uh, Alberto mentioned, you know, uh, territories, uh, agriculture frontier comes that concept, you know, you're moving this, so nice industrialization into the areas that are not being producing anything. So people there, they're not producing food, not reproducing life. So when we say, well, maybe it's not that so creative. Maybe it's not that so, um, you know, ontologically uh, even bad in terms of accumulation of wealth is creating wealth, right? So then the agrarian extractivism comes, that's my very personal understanding, as saying, okay, it's still um, a, a production, but it's not based on creation, but on destruction. Uh, so that's the reason uh, that I mentioned uh, before, and Alberto was also talking about the, you know, the contradictions of capital. So then, that's one uh, important difference. And, then, and that, of course, brings in, us into the agrarian questions and so on. But that's one thing I, I want to point out in terms of uh, why shouldn't we just keep using the concept of industrialization of agriculture as a way to define or, or understand the, the processes of monocrops, uh, flex crops, uh, or huge um, monocultures of soya in, in South America or planted uh, eucalyptus in some places. So it's less related to this uh, rational industrial perspective and more on idea of first, rely on natural resources because it's also something even the the advanced industry sometimes say no no natural resources is something that you know is cheap is there but the, the central thing is capital or yeah, for those that are critical to capitalism cap, uh, capital and labor right so then we say no there is something else there it's uh, done it's a destructive production or if you want to Sagrai like instructivism, production, agricult, uh, uh, destructive agriculture uh, production or phenomenon. Right? So that's one important thing. L like I said before, then we bring in land in two dimensions land as a way of production, but also land is one natural resource or part of the nature. Okay, that's why it's very uh, important to, to bring in. And then comes to what uh, Alberto was telling us before, this contradiction between capital and, and nature, right? Because we tend also, particularly in terms of discussing um, uh, political ecology, we tend to concentrate our analysis in 
uh, uh, soil depletion, um, uh, deforestation, crucial elements, but land still out as, as, as in one central aspect or dimension of nature and uh, life in, uh, in Earth. Okay, so the agrarian structure him is, is saying, says, listen, there is land here and agriculture, even though cultivating, I know that's a little contradiction there, but that's something I put, just put on the table. You know, uh, we are cultivating and it is growing soil, so it's creating something. Then we say, no, it's destroying because it's uh, depleting uh, the, the water is polluting uh, the water, is polluting the soil, is soil erosion, is a land uh, change that is, you know, deforestation and comes in these monocrops uh, for three, four, ten years, and suddenly there is nothing else they can produce there because the soil is completely um, 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 uh, depleted or, or lost its capacity to reproduce, to be reproduced. Um, and uh, like both, then two, two things to do is to, to move on, Marcus. And so I would say when we're talking about uh, your use the concept of agrarian um, extractivism, we're talking about particular ways of structuring the process of production and particular of accumulation. Okay? And those particular, like uh, again, uh, Alberto was pointing out, there is no reproduction. No reproduction of those who are working, like for example, peasants or traditional communities, com common use of land and so on. Is, they have, because they spell out, because the land is concentrated, because they had to move out, because they are too sick, uh, using too much chemicals and, and so on. But also, uh, and then it is my last point is again, it's a way you're producing and accumulating wealth based on intensive use of natural resources, of resources, particularly land and water. And then we have this, let's say, this agrarian extractivism. I know I'm leaving out the, the themes of uh, exploiting labor because I know Alberto will come back to that. But then I would say, conceptually, I would say we need to bring back two uh, key elements. One is exploitation labor, that Alberto already mentioned. And another one, it is in Marx's terms a bit different, is the expropriation of nature. It's also a, uh, exploitation, but it's not necessarily directed to the work human action, but it is the appropriation, the monopoly of natural resources that also is, leads to accumulation of wealth. That's right. Um, well, what to add, uh, quite a comprehensive perspective. Uh, but yeah, building on the previous question, right? Because they, to me, there are not uh, so many breaking points, right? And, and, and also bridging what Sana and, and Sergio uh, already mentioned. Uh, just a quick note for the interpreters. Uh, you might, yeah, I'm sticking out of the uh, text that I pass it on, passed on to you following the, the, uh, the, the inspiration here. Very quickly, why you know why the notion of agroextractivism or agrarian extractivism to me is not a debate. By the way, we call it agrarian extractivism or agroextractivism. To me, the key thing is why do we need this concept if we have a whole theory of agro-industrial development, agro-business, right? And and yeah, what what's the decision, right? We have extractivism, right? For uh, hydrocarbons, uh, mining, so on and so forth, and we have agroindustrial dynamics. Well, that's you know that's to me the the the, the reason for the debate. No, why do we uh, start 
using the term. Well, to me personally, it comes in one in, in an effort to make sense of a changing uh, uh, political agrarian political economy, political ecology, and sociology at the turn of the century of the 21st century. There is several changes that. Uh, uh, at least from where I was based and working in, in Guatemala at that time, that make us and, and me uh, also see that, well, yeah, the plantation has been there for centuries, but there is something here that is changing compared to previous times. Uh, Sana was kind enough to put this forward in brief, right? What, what is the difference with this? Well, why why not calling this you know, a disruptive agro-industry or a polluting agro-industry. Well, because there is not necessarily like the, the notion of industrialization, right? In the in the traditional understanding of, well, uh, uh, the linear development paths, right? And, and uh, particularly in Marx notions of uh, creative destruction, popularized by Schumpeter, right? That Yes, the old disappears because there is a new order, right? A new way of living, understanding capital also not as a, you know, a particular company or investor, but as a social relation. There is a new way of relating with each other and nature to produce uh, uh, the goods we need, we need to live. Uh, and uh, in this process of creative destruction, yeah, do you displace these forms based on whatever labor exchanges, labor, so on and so forth, pre capitalistic? For one, that is based on, yeah, uh, industrialization, meaning, uh, yeah, this rationality of uh, uh, organizing uh, production, so on and so forth, as Sergio explained. But what happens when you substitute something with nothing or when you to put it in to play with the words of uh, Marx and Schumpeter when there is no creative distraction but an impairing distraction that not only brings anything forward but also constrains the conditions of possibility for other not only forms of production but other forms of living in that targeted socio-spatial context or ecological context uh, with the new activities. No? So to me, this is the key behind uh, uh, or my moving into the agro extractivism discussion, right? How does this impairing distraction process work? Well, in this particular case of uh, particularly uh, 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 the flex crops and commodities complexes of oil pan and uh, sugar cane in Guatemala, well, it worked precisely through two combined uh, uh, dynamics. One is indeed the uh, um, putting forward a job poor, toilsome and bodily exhaustive uh, and hyper exploitative labor regime that exhausts specifically or especially the bodies of women and children and elders who are contributing to this uh, agro extractivist enterprise without necessarily even being paid, let alone recognized, uh, while destroying existing jobs and existing livelihoods. And the other is uh, the other major dynamic is the uh, generation of environmentally but also socially toxic landscapes. Right? Uh, to me, this is the outcome of precisely looking at directions of, of directions of agrarian and environmental change around the rise of this uh, oil palm and sugarcane uh, flex crop complexes uh, uh, that bring me to to the notion of uh, yeah this is an extractivist this resembles more what we understand traditionally as extractivism in a mind or in hydrocarbon, right, than what we understand by uh, uh, agro-industry. Then this idea of the purge, in the sense that, uh, right, the, the traditional notions of agrarian 
perspective, like, well, you know, very articulated capitals against labor, but we see that when these agro-extractivist initiatives are running, they affect blindly whatever is around. Other profit-oriented, right? This is not only erasing or uh, uh, constraining the conditions of possibility of reproductive peasant economy, so on and so forth. Any other activity in that area is going to suffer once this other extractivist, particularly agro-extractivist initiative is happening. To put an example, uh, right? The rise of these oil palm and sugar cane uh, flex crop complexes happens Guatemala in particular in a context in which they were also, uh, uh, you know, highly uh, problematic agro-industrial ventures into banana, right? For export or cattle ranching. These other activities also see themselves affected, right? By the workings of the oil palm and sugar cane plantations, right? So there are, uh, it's not only a, you know, capital labor, uh, capital communities, capital, uh, let's say, uh, 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 subaltern life issue is this agro-extractivist capital against whatever is around, right? This is, to me, one of the major um, uh, aspects to, to, you know, to move from the uh, discussion of agro-industry into agro-extractivism. And this is something that we also discuss, as uh, Marcus announced in this uh, edited volume on, on agrarian extractivism in Latin America that is also now uh, available in Spanish, just to finish the advertisement, uh, free to download open access in the web of uh, CLAX. Uh, so yeah, that would be my two cents. It's a good awesome. two cents. Yeah, I think that the whole issue between what, what was kind of discussed, I'm also digressing from my notes here because I think that the question of why do we need agro-extractivism while we already have the, issue, the, the, the process of industrial farming or, or these kinds of, yeah, industrial forms. And I, I might maybe a little bit digress from, from your opinions there because I think I'm not too adamant in keeping the the distinction there because in some ways even though the historical process is different the the kinds of what kinds of shapes what kinds of all kinds of characteristics come along with it have been different industrial agriculture and both both ex, uh, agro extractivism are about making fields industrial landscapes they are about erasing existences in these landscapes and and kind of like making them into productive mediums for plant growth and 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 therefore i would say that the difference is not so much about kind but it's about difference in form or difference in scale or intensity and from there i think uh i think i I would totally say that the 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 issue of talking about industrial farming and and agro extractivism uh, separately is also in some way legitimizing these kinds of colonial narratives, colonial dynamics, where you talk about industrial farming in Europe, but then you talk about agro extractivism in the global south, even though when looking from the per, uh, perspective of of as a way of organizing life, as a way of organizing landscapes, both are extremely extractivist. Both deplete the soil. Both deplete uh, all the kinds of the material basis for the plant growth and organize all the other other kind of multi-species assemblages around that, even though there are, of course, extremely big differences as well and, and kind of like these, uh, the, the scale of violence is definitely different, but they are both extractivist and that's why I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, maybe, I, yeah. Agro-extractivism totally, in industrial farming is, is agro-extractivism in my point of view. But yeah, from uh, kind of continue on that, uh, I'm totally, I realize that I'm here with two uh, extremely uh, good uh, agro-extractivist scholars and, and I don't think I have kind of like a good definition for agro-extractivism per se, but maybe I have some, some additional uh, uh, interesting points to add to that. And I think, um, from the point of view of what what we talk about when we talk about agro extractivism is kind of 
comes from the concept of agro, agros from Greek coming through, through French to English, which just means fields or soil, belonging to fields or soil. And therefore it's about not just food production, but it's also about these, as we talked about, flex and fuel crops. And, and then also what Marcus and Maria have been talking about with, uh, with tree plantations, because they are basically, they are uh, fields of monoculture trees. And, and I think the important thing, what you also talked about, Alberto, is that the important thing is that these, even though there are extractivisms, predatory, depletive extractivisms that happens in the fields, they are a type where the, the effects feel, effects seep and kind of travel beyond the fields. So they travel to waterways, they travel to, to the surrounding landscapes. And this is super evident, for example, in Europe, even though agro-extractivism hasn't been talked in Europe in the kind of insecticide that is ha ha happening in the, the depletion and degradation of soils and, and the pollution of waterways. For example, how in Belgium, uh, every single river is unswimmable, there's there's uh, some streams in Belgium that are that are uh, so poisonous that the water itself could be classified as pesticide because of industrial industrial farming in the area, and and I guess uh, in that way also from coming from the political ontological point of view, I would say that acro extractivism then related to also the different kinds of extractivisms is again not a difference in kind but difference in form whereas for example mining is about mining minerals from the earth agro extractivism and industrial farming is about kind of mining the soil for plant growth mining the the material base of the the uh, soil's multi-species life uh, for for crop production and often only one crop but then i think what is what is characteristic uh, with agro extractivism then related to for example the conventional mining where it's so much so clearly just about taking is that in agro extractivism there is this some level of kind of reorganization of the landscape reorganization of the of the uh, material basis that has to be continuously done and upheld because production and and yields would just completely uh, uh, decrease so what is characteristic of agro extractivism is that it's it's very heavily reliant on these kind of overrides and fixes that, for example, Tony Weiss has been talking about in kind of combating these con uh, these uh, biophysical contradictions that the production system itself creates. So we have the perfect example of overrides of fertilizers, which is kind of overrides the soil's own capacity for for plant growth, and then we have the fixes of pesticides, which then kind of try to combat the the problem that is created by the production system itself, as as it has uh, eliminated the, the the kind of like natural organic uh, protection uh, through biodiversity, and. Uh, yeah, so I think in general, it's it's about what's super characteristic is this kind of like overriding of kind of trying to uh, organize landscapes, organize soils into a reduced role, into a role of mere production, mere ex extraction. And you could also say that global extract, uh, agro extractivism in, in on a kind of global level is a fix in itself to capitalism because it, it is these fuel uh, and flex crop uh, production is in some ways kind of kind of like a new frontier trying to fix the problems that capitalism globally is is currently facing with the depletion of kind of cheap and and free labor so yeah that's my my two cents okay wonderful those are very robust uh, answers um <clears throat> and a good beginning for this following two guests and the following guest about moving on to the issue of resistance and uh, transformative alternatives. So does the resistance efforts against agro-extractivism differ from resistance to other types of extractivism? What do you think of this? Is there something particular that would be resistance to agro-extractivism could take into notion about the characteristics of agro-extractivism that have now been discussed. Would you have some comments on this topic, please? Uh, maybe Sergio can, can start and we can follow the same order. Uh, well, 
uh, I, I have to, to say that I'm really listening, trying to, and thank you for the, the discussion. I think it's important that we say we try to build the concept, so it's not something that is ready. So then listen, especially you, Sana, because uh, uh, it's, it's, I've been talking to Alberto, so part of, we already know the differences, but I think you're right um, in, in several points uh, in the sense that maybe it's not not so much to establish too much difference between the things, but from my perspective, as I wanted to understand, I say what points or what aspects would be missing in our previous studies, research, and so on. And that's one reason I said brings the land back. So while Zagreus, the land was always there in our studies, but to see it from a uh, perspective that we haven't seen before, that's one. And the second, and then uh, that you point out that one of them that goes to the resistance, it's very important that when we're talking, that's again my perspective, or the way you tr we tr are trying to coin this, uh, this uh, concept, uh, when we're talking about structivism or granular structivism, we always think the, the productive part in, in sense, you know, industrial farming or producing something, even if it's depleting. Them. But there is something related to capitalism in general and structivism that not always is productive. It, it, we have to bring in the picture, the unproductive part. Or if you want a classic uh, political economy thing, the you know speculation, or rent, uh, because we we keep uh, we keep thinking about you know how the, the capital reproduce itself, you know extracting and producing something, and making profit. That's one way to see it's uh, crucial, but on the other end, is not to uh, a profit, but to rent means not, you know, you accumulating uh, wealth, not based on, on producing something, selling it as a commodity and, but in other ways, just, you know, speculative. And, and then extractivism, even mining or uh, general extractivism and grand extractivism is also rely on that. For example, saving the resources for the future. It's a, it's a way you're speculating natural resources is making a lot of accumulating control. Now, of course, I'm thinking in uh, particular in cases like Brazil, um, uh, according to our uh, system of concessions, all the water in Brazil is already uh, gave, gave into some companies and they are not exploiting, they are not uh, um, industrializing, but they are making money or they are saving for the future. That that's also being uh, what not uh, nature or natural resource means, or mining, or land. So there is a lot of accumulation in terms of not producing now, but you know saving for the future. And that also includes some green narratives. But I'm not going to get into that. But just to point it out that. Just to add what you're saying, uh, that we need to also consider that when we're talking about destructivism in general or agrarian destructivism, uh, we're also talking as a, an important, let's say, aspect of the non-productive productive perspective. Um, and then goes to the resistance. Uh, as a, being studied the agrarian and social movements for, lo for long, uh, that would say, even though we are not using the concept of agrarian extractivism, uh, that we have particularly in Latin America, but also in some countries in Africa, in India, and so on, there's uh, historical, important, uh, 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 comprehensive uh, agrarian social movements, that I would say that's the first things or the first um, more uh, that's a structure resistant that I would uh, uh, I would think of, um, but that's not that's not all, and that's also part of the debate in particular Latin America about this new developmentalism or new extractivism is that um, some of those activities or some of these extractive activities is kind of threatening. You know, kind of it's historically threatening and more recently threatening even more um, local uh, uh, groups, uh, social groups, indigenous communities, uh, traditional 
communities. Uh, in case of Brazil, there's uh, Afro-Brazilian um, uh, uh, communities, Quilombolas, because of the, the expansion of the agriculture frontier, you know, deforestation, moving into the Amazon, moving to the Cerrado biome, they suddenly been threatened by those, like Alberto has mentioned, this, you know, uh, corrosive environment uh, or this uh, um, uh, extractive activities. So then that will be another uh, new, and then because of their struggle to stay on land, because they struggle to have the right to reproduce, socially speaking, then new, uh, let's say, uh, rural subjects, new new groups are, not that they are not exi exist before, but suddenly also they struggle to survive. They are resistant against some of those extractivism. They become known by society or recognized by, because, you know, part of the crucial part in, in sociological, philosophical perspective, identity is always a relational uh, identity. So, uh, it, or, otherness, if you if you you may you know, if you want to go more philosophical conceptual thing. So then, you know, to say we are indigenous group or we are peasants or we are family farmers or we are means related to what or against. Let's say simplify it. So then, a a, a lot of a lot of uh, resistance is also born out of being threatened, their environment, their uh, way of living, their uh, territories being suddenly trying to become productive. But then I say, listen, but we have been productive here in our old ways for so long. So let us stay. We want to stay. We're not going to move. So that's amazing. And then, of course, it's easier to understand extractivism if we that was that's my perspective not that say that's only a, a local struggle but uh, we can uh, let's say understand extractivism or agrarian extractivism if we look uh, the empirical uh, struggles or how it's this is uh, happening on on the ground and the local on the regional level or or some uh, some cases in uh, sometimes a whole country or partial country, but then I say not local in a sense the you know the communitarian far away from everybody, but geographically localized. Uh, then we can uh, understand how how deep this agrarian extractivism is, is uh, depleting uh, life in in general terms. That's. It. Okay, so how do resistant, resistance efforts to agroextractivism differ from resistance to other forms of extractivism? Uh, I don't think there is an essential, necessarily an essential difference, uh, 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 but there might be many differences regarding, uh, yeah, repertoires uh, of contention, strategies, forms of, uh, of struggle in particular. No? Uh, to me, uh, there are, in all kinds of uh, uh, changing environments, right? Uh, 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 in the face of different type of um, changes, right? In this case, let's say, well, through an agro-extractivist project, or through a mining project or through a uh, hydrocarbon extraction project. I believe that, you know, the usual frames of, you know, defense of territory, not in my backyard, not in my village that you see across North, Global North, Global South, East and West divides still apply, right? I don't think there is essentially a difference. I agree with Sergio that there are political subjectivities in the making in resistance processes, but that can happen in the struggle against the mind or in the struggle against, uh, 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 let's say, an, uh, yeah, an eucalyptus plantation, right? Uh, what I think there might be some particularities coming back to questions of scale and forms that Sana raises, well, yes, let's talk about 
the resource property question, right? How, you know, uh, uh, there are changes in who controls what resources for what purposes. And uh, one of them, let's say related to agroextractivism might be that unlike a mining concession that might happen to be not only in private or collectively owned, uh, individually or collectively owned private land, but also in public land, right? There is usual dispossession of small direct scale, uh, small scale, sorry, or uh, uh, family farmers, right? In order to implement these other uh, uh, agroextractivist projects, right? So the forms of dispossession, the forms of inclusion, right? Uh, uh, it depends very much if it's, you know, if it's uh, exploiting uh, oil, uh, extracting oil from the soil or a mine. Uh, well, but when we are talking about plantation led or agriculture, not only plantation, right? Uh, this, to me, this question of agroextractivism can also happen, you know, regardless of the uh, plantation, the tropical plantation, right? Can happen in the greenhouses that maybe you were thinking of in Belgium when you were putting your example, right, Sana? So, uh, 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 the point to the forms of in, of inclusion, right? There might be other forms, other options, right? Let's say one that comes to me very uh, to mind quickly is uh, forms of contract farming, right? That it will be difficult. Of course, there are also, you know, mining companies that buy from traditional miners and so on and so forth. But yeah, I believe that. Uh, these different forms of dispossession, different forms of inclusion allow for different forms of contestation, right? Uh, and this is the debate a little bit going beyond uh, the question of uh, or the current question. This is uh, uh, the debate on the forms of resistance. And by this, I'm not only talking about organized and invisibilized, right? Uh, the everyday forms and the organized forms by movements. Yes, that is one difference. Uh, but to me, a key difference there is, yeah, what are you resisting for, right? What is the purpose of your resistance? Are you resisting it because you really want to uh, uh, push out this particular extractivist, agro-extractivist project from your uh, life territory because you already had or you want to have a different alternative life project. Therefore, there is no space for the two. There's no space for the mine, for the uh, uh, oil uh, flex crop complex and your, let's say, whatever family farmer uh, life project. Or are you resisting? Are you contesting the mine? the plantation, so on and so forth, because you actually want to, you know, be included in more advantageous terms in that extractivist activity, right? Uh, and therefore, yeah, the different forms of dispossession, different forms of inclusion dictate different forms of uh, resistances. And I think to me, this, uh, this is a fruitful debate to, to engage uh, with beyond, you know, to go beyond the question of, you know, the, the, the resistance as a homogeneous no from whoever lives there uh, before the external, the newcomer extractivist or agro-extractivist project arrives, right? To go beyond that uh, dichotomy of the, you know, pristine uh, uh, life, the good guys, girls living there, and then there is this other terrible uh, 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 capitals that come and... and, and Every day uh, life to move into the complexities of well how do we manage the, the monster when it comes right how do we deal with it from especially thinking from an everyday life perspective and in a long time perspective right beyond okay what is the situation when they arrive let's look at how the situation goes changing while these new political subjectivities are built and contested right so let's look into, in brief, multiple dynamic and generative politics of agroextractivism or extractivism in general. Yeah, I totally uh, agree. 
uh, with the aforesaid uh, arguments. And uh, I guess fundamentally, even though I do see that that resistance or any kind of transformative resistance uh, against extra extractivisms is and has to always be about kind of countering the commodification of life, countering the kind of uh, uh, colonization, colonization of, of lands and labor and bodies. But there are, of course, these quite major differences between the urgency and the scale and the severity of, of these different projects, extractivist projects. So, so I would say that, for example, resisting against land grabs and, and chemical pollution plantations and kind of contamination of the lived world that you yourself are, are uh, inhabiting is different to kind of like resisting these kinds of less overt forms of extractivism, because I think the question of agro -ex extractivism and the resistance uh, uh, to, uh, against that and the centralization of, for example, food production is so much about kind of like fundamental power to lead your life the way you want to be, how you're, how, what you eat, how you uh, are connected to the web of life. And, and uh, like my very good friend Rachel Mazak once has said that food is one of the most intimate relations that that people have with the with the web of life. I think it was you maybe. Uh, and I think that agro extractivism is such a direct, direct attack towards that, unlike, for example, kind of like a mine that is that is maybe in a very specific uh, place, but the expansion of kind of extractivist logic uh, on all all kinds of uh, agricultural production is such a direct attack on kind of like and degradation of how humans are able to live life at all what we're able to eat how we're able to use the commons around us how we're able to to kind of like reproduce life and but yeah i think in general uh resistances against all extractivisms is kind of are kind of uh what kind of life ways are possible what kinds of existences are possible, uh, both human and other than human. And I think that's why also it's really interesting, this whole political ontological aspect there, like Marisol de la Cadena has said that that, that political ontological struggles are, are often arising exactly because of extractivist and kind of like anthropocentric projects, uh, because they are narrowing down the, the potentials for other ways of living. And, and I think agro-extractivism uh, is a perfect example of that and resistance is against that. But yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we have still one guest and so maybe quick answers to that one so we can follow up with the discussion comments and, the, and then the debate with everybody. So this last one is about the different usages of the concept of extractivism in different languages. So what are the rules? and consequences of different languages uses of the extractivism concept. So maybe Sergio, if you can comment shortly about the Brazilian situation where extractivism is used also in another sense than in these English language or Spanish language discussions and about that, that, that situation there and what do you think of it? And then maybe if, if, if you want to comment something shortly about the Spanish words and, and differences with, with, with English and then maybe some other languages, please. Okay. Um, let's see if we can make a very complex discussion simple answer. Eh? <laughs> but I would say, um, just for those who are not uh, uh, well known with this, uh, we have um, 40 years now, uh, a struggle starting with related to the Amazon, the destruction or deforestation. A struggle of the the rub tappers uh, in the Amazon trying to to resist to the expansion of agriculture frontier, particularly deforestation and for for cattle range in states like Acre, but also the state of Amazon and and so on. So uh, and then when uh, she commended, so was an uh, important uh, 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 trade trade union leader. Uh, 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 rural trade union leader, um, they create this um, a movement, they, they, they call uh, Conselho Nacional de Seringueiros, the national um, uh, trade union of uh, rub tappers. 
and for they had a long history of struggle to create what they call uh, extractive reserves. That's uh, still it's a coin under Brazilian legislation. It's a part of um, this um, environmental system uh, protection. Right? They have parks, national forests, and also this called extractive extractive reserves means. Um, they are kind of parks. Uh, the, the native deforestation must be kept, uh, but the people can live there and, and keep their activities. So for, for three decades, I would say, they, they call themselves rock tappers, but for, for uh, different reasons, new struggles, uh, um, need to, to face new threats, to uh, address different uh, challenges they decided to call themselves not uh, uh, Conselho Nacional de Seringueiros, but uh, National Council, National Federation of uh, Extractive People. Um, so that's the, basically where, where the, the subject is. So there is there is one, let's say, uh, state legal framework is that the concept uh, legal concept of uh, extractive reserve and then there's exactly the opposite that, that we're talking here so extractive not as a destructive activity but uh, human activities living there uh, collecting uh, woods collecting fruits uh, fishing picking uh, seeds and so on and commercialize them making living but but preserving the the the, the natural or say living out of the natural resources preserving or conservating the 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 nature but then they say we are those who are protecting the nature the amazon but we're not just protectors like environmentalists we are workers so that's one reason uh, the the notion of is extractive or extractivism came because they said we are working. We're not just sitting around, uh, you know, uh, not allowing you know, other people to turn down the forest and you know make it more productive, produce food for the world. No, no, we are we are producing food. We are producing. We are workers. So then the the concept comes. To say we are people that are working, we are workers. Our labor is extractive labor, but not in a destructive sense, but in a sustainable way. So that creates for us a, a political conceptual problem, right? So now we're using this, you know, conceptual, this uh, interpretative concept as a, a bad capitalism or maldevelopment, or uh, and they are saying, and they are politically standing up saying we are extractive communities uh, we are extractive people we are extractive uh, workers fishing uh, collecting fruits uh, but there's 27 28 different uh, productive activities that are under this journal concept so how to solve it? Uh, <laughs> sorry, Mark, because I don't have the answer. But that's the let's say this the, the political uh, uh, concept. And it, for my perspective, if I wanna say they have the right of self definition, right, or the self identification, how can I say no, no, you cannot be called extractive because you know the capitalism is extractive and we. But anyway, um, and in Portuguese, uh, Alberto can say a bit about uh, about uh, in Spanish. But in Portuguese, we don't have a in 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 English. We we could also you know using gathering, right? It's not distractive or or in case of fish fishing. But uh, in Portuguese, we all of this means particular sector activity. Let's say. Uh, and extractive is, is kind of a broad uh, perspective. So then one thing you say, extractivism as a system is one thing. Extractive or extractivism as activity is something else. Is that possible? I don't know. Uh, but that's part of our sociological and political challenge for, for the near future. Thank you.
Well, very, very quickly, because I have little to add to this, I think, semiological discussion, but I, the way we fix it, right, with uh, my colleagues Ben McKay and Arturo Esquerro Cañete is, well, yes, strativismo, uh, and let me speak, or let me remind everybody that I'm neither a Portuguese or an English native speaker, right, but how we navigated this is, the way I would translate to English the strativism of the Sheringueiros and other forest communities or, or river communities in Brazil is like collectors, gatherers, right? Because there is no product, there is no farming involved. There is no, right? Uh, so that to me solves it in English and in Spanish because it's so close, right? The strativism and extra extractivismo. What we do is to say, hey, this is a book about agrarian extractivism in Latin America. What do we mean by this? Is not the strativismo uh, understood of these gathering communities in uh, um, Brazil, right? That's that's a little bit how we fix it. It's not so, but just to make ourselves uh, uh, understandable, also for a Portuguese-speaking uh, communities, right? This this would be my uh, quick addition. How about you? Yeah, I'm not sure. Do I have too much to add to, to what already has been discussed? But I think in general, the whole issue of language, of naming things is so pertinent and so important in, in understanding the world in general. And and yeah, I think because in there is really no in Finnish and for example, in Swedish, there isn't really uh, a good translation for extractivism. And, and that, of course, does have implications of, for example, that my mom doesn't know what I do for for in my research but I don't think that the that can only be solved by finding a Finnish translation for the word because uh new words are always adop adopted to to languages and and you just need to like you said that it just needs then modifiers it needs uh uh kind of like yeah explanations and and for example pizza wasn't a Finnish word, but everyone in Finland knows knows what pizza is. So like maybe extractivism can become as known as pizza in Finland as well. So, yeah. One minute, one minute. One minute. I think uh, you make a very good point, uh, Alberto, but still uh, like, well, here I, said, I think it's important that another debate behind that is the discussion about calling those people peasants or not. It's, it's another, another whole workshop or, or round table for that. But anyway, um, for example, uh, you, you make a very good point, Alberto, but there's no, there's no such thing as a group that's only fishing or only um, uh, gathering woods because they are, as a way you're living in, particularly in Amazon, but not also in Amazon, Cerrado also, they combine activities. So they fish in the morning to sell and make some money, but they they garden because they raise corn, uh, manioc and so on for the family and, and for change in the community, but also they collect um, rubber in the, in the afternoon. So it's, um, it's, it's a very multi-task or multifunctional communities. So that <laughs> just collectors doesn't doesn't fit because they're not just collecting. That's part of their discussion. Uh, you know, just gathering or picking. They're not picking. They're also cutting wood sometimes because, you know, they're humans. They need fire to cook they need uh, heat. Oh, uh, anyway but that's part of the debate and just to finish I agree with Sana there's one thing I like Per Bourdieu he say human uh, sorry uh, uh, social scientists social science deals with name realities he say it's not the problem the name but how we interpret the reality it goes through names so if we call extractivism, there is consequences that political, uh, conceptual interpretations. It, yeah, we only can understand. So it's not just a debate in terms of language. Yeah. It's not saying uh, just putting on the table the discussion um, has uh, a, a has a reality behind that that is uh, named 
uh, that should be changed or interpreted or understood or supported or depending on his resistance and so on. So then it's a discussion of terms, of course, but it's not just language. It's not philosophy of language. It's uh, what the name means or how the name um, nominated, no, uh, interpret or pointed the direction that we see that that reality is extractivism, is capitalism, is, and so on. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Let's come back to that complicated issue of <laughs> having now new literature in Brazil that is using the same term in Portuguese, extractivismo, for talking about this rubber trappers, but then also talking about, you know, monoculture plantations. So that's a, a dilemma when these literatures are starting to grow, but using the, exactly the same concept also academically and analytically. So yeah, but please, next Barry Gills will give his comments and after that Franklin Obengo Doom and you can make notes if you want to then reply to the comments and we can also open up then the floor for audience questions. Well, thank you, Marcus and everyone. Uh, well, this has really been an extremely rich discussion so far and I'm very grateful and uh, somewhat uh, awed by its richness. I, I only have some comments, not questions for you. So like, uh, looking at this, it just seems to drive home my own sense of the magnitude of the destructiveness of, of agrarian extractivism. And Vandana Shiva, I think, has been recently campaigning again, say, making the argument that in her view, the industrial food system or the global industrial food regime is actually the, the single most destructive process driving the present ecological crisis in the world. Yes. So, I mean, it, it has driven home that, you know, we have been we have been entertaining this uh, fundamental aspect of the definition of extractivism as depletion entropy processes, destruction, dislocations, harms, you know, as indispensable to the definition of extractivism. But this is, uh, this is profoundly the case in terms of the agrarian extractivism. And for all the reasons that were discussed, I mean, in a sense that um, it seems to, because we are dealing with the land and what is the land? The land is the earth. And what is the earth? The earth is the web of life. And what is the web of life? It is all existence. All existences that are alive and all interrelated, yeah? So that our civilization is extractivist. And this m recent mode of the capitalist reorganization of these extractivist processes has been ultra destructive, both in terms of the web of life and socially. Yeah, so I mean, it just drove home, listening to you t today, just drove this home more, more, more forcefully than even before. Uh, and, then, and then it just finally it kind of made me do go back to some things which I'm sure you're all familiar with, like the work of Moore and Patel, the seven cheap things. It begins with the engagement with the idea of externalities in the dominant standard neoclassical neoliberal economics. Yeah. Well, this comes right round again. You know, this is the this shows us the enormity of the po the poverty of the economics paradigm that is behind all of this, right? Uh, you know, that it, this problem of externalities is actually one of, of, of extraordinary importance, right? So then it, it, it brings us to like, to, to try to finally just, you know, deal with uh, not only the false economics of that paradigm, but, you know, the, the whole consequences, like how, how, what are the most effective forms of resisting it? What are the most effective forms of creating alternatives to it? You know, this is where it leads us, you know, in all the complexities around that and challenging it as a global system. This was the global part, you know. We didn't really talk much about financialization and, uh, and its role uh, in, so, in some of this, although there's been quite a bit of work done on that. And I think through the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam has done expl explicitly done work on this and many others. There's a whole literature there. So which maybe that could be discussed a bit, a little further about this, that element of you know, uh, capital accumulation on world scale through uh, agrarian extractivism as a mode, but but how it's linked, it is, is inseparably linked, I would argue, causally 
to the present severity of the ecological and climate crisis, which in my view and many others is a civilizational crisis. Our civilization has grown to be an extractivist based civilization to such a destructive extent that now it's an existential threat to our species as well as to myriad other species. So I'm just kind of teasing out where this leads, what I heard today and reinforce some of my previous notions about these things. So thank you very much again for your excellent contributions today. Okay, thank you, Barry. So next we will have Franklin Obengodin from uh, Zoom. He will be comments. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me, by, uh, Barry, my Christian, everyone? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So, like Barry, I found these uh, reflections and works on agro extractivism uh, extensive and, and engaging. Uh, they show that the ecological crisis uh, cannot be reduced to climate change alone. Um, dispossession and displacement through capitalist uh, extractivism uh, is important. Uh, so is the loss of food uh, sovereignty. The concept therefore uh, seems to unite the social, uh, the economic, and the uh, ecological. I would like to highlight three issues in terms of crit critical comments. Um, I yearned to learn more about how we can use agro extractivism uh, in, the, in the context of urban development, um, not only because much of the world uh, today is urban, but also because urban agriculture is substantial in the global south. Uh, perhaps a more careful analysis of urban land rent could demonstrate uh, such extractivism. Also, while almost in all cases, um, description, critique and alternatives, it seems that gender and class are taken seriously. Um, how these identities intersect with race, I thought could be unpacked and unpicked a bit more. Uh, surely for societies with substantial descendants of slaves, probing questions of race and social stratification uh, is critical to the ecological question, um, making it not only um, historical, but also uh, historiographical. Um, finally, it seems most of the resistance uh, and alternatives are local. And I was keen to learn a bit more about global and multi scale ones like uh, ecological reparations. Uh, no one concept theory or framework can address every socio-ecological issue, but because agro extractivism or extractivism more broadly uh, in the works and reflections and the discussion can be seen to be an organizing uh, framework, uh, the case could be made for making it even more holistic. Uh, but otherwise, I think this excellent collection and recollections and reflections, um, as well as the poignant uh, addendum by, by Sana clearly contain the seats for even more things scholarly and activist breakthrough. So congrats to the, you know, to everyone who has made uh, contributions to the ongoing uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe I don't see any questions from the chat, but does the audience have any questions at this point? Would you like to make any questions? If you have one, please come here in front. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, maybe you couldn't hear me, but then if the audience wants to make any questions, you can make questions and also 
from the chat and, and Zoom. But that, is there anybody here in the room who would like to talk or make a guess or now or commentary? Maybe, yeah, if you can come in front so people can see you from the video uh, who you are. Yeah, so the, no, no, not from, but, but people in the Zoom can see you. And um, <clears throat> hello. Where's the camera? There. Hello. Thanks uh, for arranging this important roundtable. Uh, I have many questions, but I will start with one because uh, I'm trying to, I, I don't know the debate on uh, agrarian extractivism, but I do know something about critical agrarian studies. So I was wondering what is the relation or how they position uh, together or relate to one another uh, as fields. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Maybe let me take one more from Mariana Kalsakni from Zoom. So please, you can make the guessing. Mariana. Thank you very much. Um, greetings from Germany. I'm studying a PhD in sociology at the Food for Justice research program. Um, in the Freie Universität Berlin. And we are actually um, researching similar topics in Latin America and, and Europe. So to hear your contributions has been really, really important for our work. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping we can continue the discussion and get to know each other more in, in other uh, contexts. I was wondering, and maybe a direct question to Alberto, was related to what you comment on, on the, um, like the idea that you mentioned something like what happens when, when you substitute something with nothing, uh, talking about agroactivism. And I was, I was wondering, um, is it so? Do you consider that agroactivism do not uh, contribute to anyone or no one is getting um, benefits out of it because I I really enjoy the conversation today but I'm thinking also that we are missing part of the of the stakeholders that are in in charge of running the system so when we talk about um, extractivism or um, yeah any type like the capitalist system somehow it's it seems to me like uh, we bought the idea of this um, invisible hand that it's managing everything and we are not seeing who are actually the actors who are getting benefited from this system. So I was um, wondering whether you could elaborate more on this, um, on these inequalities. So to me, it's about, um, yeah, and socio-environmental justice and in this system, Unfortunately, there are people who are getting really, really benefited. And sometimes we just put the focus on the ones who are the most vulnerable, of course, because we we are committed as social scientists as well to try to put like put the focus on them. But at the same time, that does not help the resistance to, to understand who are we fighting against. So in concrete terms, I mean. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. And then maybe we could have the responses in the reverse order. So maybe if, if Sana, you would like to start and then Alberto and, and Sergio. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, super, super good comments and, and uh, many thoughts arose from them. And I think that to start with Barry's, Barry's comments is that I totally agree that it, it is the, the intensity and the urgency and the kind of connections with that extractivism has with with all of the overlapping global crisis is is forcing us to rethink in a way uh, how societies are relating to to uh, and and uh, communities are relating to to everything and I think that in discussing agro extractivism it's it's such an important thing to realize the kind of like the landscape effects that these are about extinctions but they're not just about extinctions that may kind of species completely disappear but it's about extinctions and kind of erasures of life 
that that empty landscapes that reduce existence into this kind of homogeneous uh, simplified form and therefore it's way way deeper and and more uh catastrophic than kind of like the biodiversity and and extinction rates and kind of statistics uh suggest which is a super scary thought in itself and that kind of also then relates to to uh franklin's uh, question about kind of like the connection to urban context and how how agro extractivism is currently uh, or an industrial farming has currently created these landscapes where, for example, bird populations are can be way more diverse in urban settings than they are in the neighboring fields and kind of rural landscapes. And this is not to kind of talk to or or, or perpetuate this idea of of the dichotomy between urban and rural because they're they're very co-constitutive and and the whole level of urbanization and kind of like the mo normality of modernity currently is built on industrial revolution uh, or like uh, agricultural revolution and the form of farming that that is currently normalized uh so these are building each other definitely and uh yeah but in in general also i think what franklin uh discussed the, the issue of urban is that there's so much potential for alternatives and resistances from urban context because agro extractivisms and industrial uh industrial farming are dependent and kind of like are fundamentally growing out from these principles of efficiency or presumed efficiency and these uh, principles of scale and scaling up always always expanding which is not in a way possible in urban settings so it can create these like pockets of farming uh, just because of the kind of physical physical organization of the environment and the issue of what Franklin also brought up of race and class I think the class issue is so so pertinent uh, related to this and and from my kind of own perspective which is from Europe is that there's currently kind of uh, examples of how industrial farming and this corporate corporatization of farming uh, is kind of creating this new form of modern feudalism in Europe as well, which is super interesting, I think, and hasn't really been discussed or, or studied in literature. But there are examples of this, for example, especially in the newer uh, European Union's member states. Um, and yeah, it's just, again, about kind of what kinds of worlds we're creating with these production systems. And, and yeah, and... Um, I think Mariana's question about the invisibility of the beneficiaries is is so important because extractivism is very much founded on kind of ex exploiting the unaccounted, extracting the the cheapens, the invisibilized lives and labor and bodies, and and uh, that also applies to then to the other side that the invisibility of kind of who are the ones that are benefiting from this is part of the dynamics that normalize and legitimize this system but there they definitely exist these people have names they have addresses these corporations have addresses and names and and, and bank accounts so they do totally exist and it's it's i love that you brought that up mariana and i think tony's uh is it tony yeah uh your question about the critical agrarian studies and I'll let these grown-ups answer to that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Exciting uh, uh, and 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 thought-provoking comments and questions. Thank you, uh, uh, Barry and, and Franklin, for taking the time to listen to read uh, uh, this work. Uh, or, uh, yeah, many things to comment briefly, both uh, uh, particularly Barry's engagement with uh, right, the, the, the neoclassical economics perspective on uh, uh, environmental externalities, right? Uh, from what it's called now environmental economics, right? And uh, Franklin's comment on, well, yeah, uh, yeah, on intersectionality, right? He raised the issue of he raised the issue of race, uh, which I think is a key one. Uh, that you know, it 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 all depends on the on the context, uh, um, right? What actual sociocultural attributes matter? But in brief, intersectional accounts of uh, uh, 
dynamics of agrarian change, Tony, are key, right, to me. So all this to say, it all boils to methodological questions, right? How do we actually investigate contemporary dynamics of agrarian, and I would say environmental change? We cannot separate, right? Talking about critical agrarian studies that was focused on agro agriculture, right? The, so from a, a, let's say, integrative rural sociology perspective, right? How do we make sense of contemporary directions of agrarian and environmental change? Not only that there are all these dynamics, yes, of course, we, we get to know, right? The, we have all the, since the Stern report and, and others, we know the destructive effects of uh, uh, the current, uh, the dominant agri-industry uh, or, or uh, agri-food system and so on and so forth. To me, once again, the key is how do we investigate? How do we understand? How do we make sense of this complex and overwhelming realities, right? So I think that in a critical and intersectional fashion is a way to go, right? Critical in the sense, what do I mean by critical? Yeah, critical um, of the dominant and critical of the alternatives, right? Uh, precisely critical of the alternatives to see how can we actually support these alternatives, not the alternative, but the multiple alternatives that are working uh, uh, for different intersectionalized identities, socio-spatial contexts, so on and so forth, right? So uh, to me, how do I bring in or go beyond the question of externalities? Well, I rely on the work of, uh, of course, yeah, uh, uh, Muran Patel for sure, inspiring uh, Joan Martinez Salier and uh, O'Connor already that brought this up in 1996 when they, you know, stood for an ecological economics paradigm, right? That actually doesn't look into externalities, but into this, you know, uh, uh, environmental distribution relations, right? Of environmental goods and burdens, right? Uh, so I think we need to bring, you know, when Sergio was talking, we need to look also into the uh, nature capital contradiction, right? I think we need the, 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 the challenge here is how do we make sense of environmental material symbolic aspects, right? In a new approach to critical agrarian studies. Right? This is a new, or let's say, not, not, not that we come up with something new, but in a more integrative, let's call it like that, in which we benefit from learnings of political ecology, ecological economics, political sociology, anthropology, and of course, the traditional uh, uh, agrarian studies field of, you know, center on productive labor, uh, land property or property regimes, and so on and so forth. So this broadly to uh, Tony's Barry uh, Franklin's, quickly to uh, 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 Mariana's comment, absolutely uh, uh, agree, right? When I said substitute uh, uh, something for nothing, I, uh, Mariana was, I was referring to the perspective of the underprivileged in the sense that substituting something in which I was able, you know, to reproduce my life, my community, my way of living, for something that does not allow me to do so, or at least in advantageous or, you know, interesting terms, right? Quickly to this notion of impairing destruction, right? As opposed to the creative destruction of capitalism. To me, this is key. I hope it is simple, but not simplistic to put it in these terms, right? Sergio was talking about it, creative destruction. Yeah, we destroy these peasants, right? Enclosures that Marx already discussed and so on and so forth. Because, yeah, you people, don't worry. You will now work in the industry. It's not what you want, but at least you'll find a way of reproducing yourselves. My point is, what happens when you substitute some even precarious forms of reproduction, which are not, you know, we don't need to idealize them, but when you substitute that for nothing in the sense, uh, Mariana, for a new model that constrains the conditions of reproduction or even eliminates them, what you have is redundant surplus populations, right? And you don't have the convenient latent 
section of the reserve army of labor, right? People who goes in and out of the labor market. No, we have what also Marx considered stagnant section of surplus population, people who never works. And in different contexts, and I, I think here is one way in which the global north-south, oh, let's put it like that, the welfare, non-welfare state matters, right? When you are not able to get a subsidy for, you know, that to, to, to feed you, you need to do something. You fall into precarity, informality, you migrate, you try to, you know, uh, fight or flight, or you also, you know, get involved into forms of criminal entrepreneurship, right? Why would you call it crime? It's, it's, a, it's a way of living, you know, you get into drug trafficking cartels, you get into uh, mafias, you get into youth gangs, uh, criminal youth gangs in my experience in Central America, right? The Mara phenomenon and so on and so forth. So I think... Uh, uh, Mariana, this question of impairing destruction leads us to this to think on in terms of uh, uh, yeah the fate responses of stagnant surplus populations. E to what Mariana said, but and I don't want to go now beyond uh, uh, Mariana's question is indeed to study the political agenda of the powerful. That I think is our uh, uh, commitment. Right, as Mariana suggested, no. In my experience, uh, I don't know others in the chat, in the room, you know, in 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 my uh, interaction with social movements, particularly with organized social movements, not necessarily with uh, uh, you know more spontaneous community re resistance responses, but with organized peasant socialism. Like, yeah, are you gonna make another study of us? Because we know how we emerge how we fight over strategies why don't you help us understanding how these companies or a state company right a capital state alliance uh, individuals elites oligarchy whoever is behind these extractivist activities how they think what are their plans how are they strategizing how are they now moving from you know the narrative of we bring progress and employment to no, we are saving the world because, you know, we are producing biomaterials, right? That is what I think we, uh, and I agree, uh, if, and that is also your take, Mariana, I agree with that, that we need to put names, but not only to name and shame, but to understand how they uh, uh, actually, how the agenda of the powerful, uh, the political agenda of the powerful works. Uh, well, me from, from from my side also thank you Barry Franklin and also for the comments and, uh, and sharing some of the things that I think is very challenging. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Also the questions. I would I would just make two or three quick points. One, um, financier financierization. I think it's a it's a very important uh, also. Uh, the uh, analytical framework, uh, and I just mentioned you know, the, the speculative perspective of extractivism, I think it's a part of that. Uh, and also, particularly for, for our grand studies, uh, we kind of lost along the way the, the centrality of rent, right? Because even we talk about a lot of land concentration and so on, but sometimes uh, in our analysis, uh, uh, and it's becoming more and more important in this, um, you know, financialization uh, process. And then it goes just beyond uh, land, right? Also water or nature as, as rent, or let's say uh, natural rent uh, or, or appropriation of rent out of uh, nature. I, I, I try to avoid natural resources here as, as a concept, but I'm not going to get into that. That's that's the, the point. I, I, and something that we should uh, uh, go back in a sense to to reread and uh, and uh, rethink the the whole, the role of rent and uh, and speculation in these processes of uh, capitalist accumulation or if if uh, we keep the, this the concept of agrarian extractivism okay that's one point a second I think uh, just when I, I don't have any authority. 
uh, to, to talk about it, but I think the, the racial aspect is crucial. Thank you, Franklin, for, for bringing that. But I'm just going to tell you the case, Brazilian case. Uh, I'll try to not to, to, to take too long. Uh, our colonial structure was based on slavery, right? African slavery. And uh, what happened in, in Brazil is that before freeing the slaves, they captured the land. So the only way to, um, to access land after 1824 was to buy land. 20 years later, 30 years later, there was this, Brazil was the last country in the world to, to uh, end uh, slavery. So it's kind of a sh really historical shame. But anyway, the, 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 the landowner, the, the Brazilian elite, you know, to, to make sure that you know, the black people will not have access to land, they first uh, captured the land into the capitalist idea. So when a land, you had to buy it. So then, of course, then today, uh, the, the land in Brazil is very, very concentrated. You know, less than 1% of the owners possess around 50% of the land. When we, we cut and see how many black people have access to land, then the concentration is even worse. There's, there's no black owners of a plot of land uh, above 100 hectares or something, right? It's, it's just really, really uh, because of this historical process. But you know, of course, the families were slaves working in sugar plantations where they have they were free okay they flee to the cities they you know because th that kind of kid activities also was part of being slaves right so they want to get out of that but anyway so then the racial analysis or or to look through the glasses of a racial perspective is really important in in this land issue land access land um, uh, use and so on yeah, I'm talking particularly about Brazil, but we could reproduce or, or could look also in Colombia and some other countries. Okay. But at the same time, and that's, I think it's important, and I mentioned uh, at the same time, we have this historical social movement. It's called Quilombolas, our communities, black communities, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight generations of these families that were slaves and they resisted and they create communities and they are demanding land. So then, so then I would say the, the, the racial perspective is in both directions. Also, there is resistance, there is a uh, struggle for rights uh, in terms of, of uh, land issue or critical guidance studies. And then the last point is uh, that's exactly what we're trying to kind of kind of bring in, uh, uh, we have the classical agrarian studies, right? Or critical agrarian studies, land and uh, labor. But then suddenly they say, well, how about nature? How about seeing uh, land uh, beyond way of production? That There's a whole debate on that. So then it's uh, what we three trying to do here is a combination of at least three different disciplines, you know, critical agrarian studies, uh, political economy, political ecology, and uh, some sociology, some anthropology, and so on. But that, that's how critical agrarian studies comes in. And I would say, that's my uh, perspective, I think just to learn from like political ecology, is to see some of the, the some of the great issues of uh, uh, our grand studies in in a little bit different perspective, or adding elements like present this you know, land as part of the nature and how land has been appropriated uh, through rent or nature rent as mentioned before. Um, and the other thing for me again, I'm always speaking based on Brazilian concept context, the whole debate on who is peasant, uh, that's also part of the second, say, leg of this critical grand studies. Uh, recently, just because of the struggles, resistance against agrarian extractivism and other forms of exploitation, you see some, suddenly uh, 
different political subjects. Uh, like I was saying, you know, uh, extractive communities combined with uh, fishing folks, and suddenly they were all together in, in national networks, struggling for land, struggling for territory, struggling for rights to being uh, fish uh, folks or 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 uh, collecting uh, woods, and they they kind of say we are all workers. And some of them say, well, we're not peasants. Anyway, just to say that's part of the agenda, political agenda in studies and research of these critical awareness studies, looking from different perspectives, looking for those uh, cases of resistance and struggle. They have been there. And some of us uh, didn't look at or, or were concerned with different uh, issues. Uh, and suddenly the, those are important in research at the agenda, talking from a scholar or academic perspective, but also political agenda in terms of uh, uh, environmental justice or, you know, agrarian justice or um, uh, land redistribution, land reform, or ways of uh, 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 resisting to this agrarian extractivism. And then the whole agroecology perspective uh, is also kind of a synthesis between at least uh, critical agrarian studies in one way and political ecology in another way. Uh, is a solution? No, it's again, it's a field of research open. Please join us because uh, I think it's, uh, it's challenging both ways in ways of that we need urgent solution because like Barry saying, we're gonna die if we don't you know, move out of that. So then we also need research, we need uh, formulations, we need conceptual, political stand to, to really make differences uh, and then resistance becomes alternative in terms of way of living and surviving in this web called earth or land. Thank you. Thank you. Great, so we have some other questions from the chat. So there's a question from Tony. How is the dependency of fossil fuels discussed in the debates on agrarian extractivism? How do you perceive the potential regimes of agrarian extractivism in post fossil fuel scenarios, considering the heavy utilization of fossil fuels in industrial farming, fuel for machines, fertilizers, pesticides, and so on? So who would like to answer this? I can let it go. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's a super good question. And and uh, I think kind of somehow related to also the previous issues uh, that were discussed is that what's uh, at the root of extractivism is so much about what is how o o the kind of mechanisms and strategies that are making land available, making land to be available to extract it and kind of making it cheap. And for example, fossil fuels and these different... Uh, uh, like pesticides and fertilizer and everything, they are parts of that process of making it available to be extracted in the intensity and scale that that is currently happening. And as I think it's, is it Tony Wise who's, who's talking about how, how uh, industrial farming is actually about kind of transforming fossil fuels into food. And that is basically what is happening there. So extractivist agriculture really cannot exist without fossil fuels. So post uh, carbon world, post fossil fuels world will will have to uh, be post -extr extractivist in that way. And uh, yeah, and, and other other thing kind of like related to the making things available and, and to I just quick, 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 quick uh, argument on that uh, related to Franklin's uh, comment as well is the kind of whole issue of and what Mariana was talking about and Alberto there of all these strategies of these like the people at power, the, the powers that be, uh, the strategies and mechanisms and processes that are kind of how are how are all these uh, upheld, how are these expanded and and so much of that is also uh, epistemological, ontological, violent uh, kind of reorganizations of, of rights of people and rights of, of other beings where racism colonial relations are so at the center of what, how are, for example, uh, 
other beings rendered into this passive pool of resources that can be extracted and and there i think technological things like pesticides fertilizers fossil fuels mechanization those are part of a part of that but so is the kind of uh intangible uh processes of for example different kinds of colonial narratives and and such yeah so i totally mixed two unrelated questions there you're welcome <laughs> Um, all right, maybe, maybe, or maybe not, Sana, but I think I would disagree with you on the statement that decarbonizing our societies would necessarily lead to a post extractivist world. Yeah, no? I agree. Yeah. I think uh, I'm very much inspired by uh, Harriet Friedman, who already said in 2005, right? Yes, it is possible. It, that you know the green transition is possible while keeping capitalism alive my own empirical research uh, uh, tony if the tony of the chat is also the tony in the room yeah uh, which is a very smart way of posing two questions right the tony avatar and the real tony uh, my own empirical research is actually uh, uh, informing or is telling me or showing me how uh, path breaking, not all, but trailblazing corporations who were among the most polluting or key exponents of the ecologically destructive agri commodity world system are already trying to fix their uh, contradiction with nature right because they know if we don't do something yeah uh, as mariana also remind us uh, if we don't do something it's not only the underprivileged the working people who would suffer is we won't make any more business right there's no planet unless we get access to another planet right but thus far is here is our world this is where we move and i think there are fixes that go ecological fixes that go beyond mere greenwashing. I, and I think this is to me a key political issue. It's very easy to disregard these narratives by corporations. Now I'm talking about the flex crop complexes in particular as yeah, the usual green uh, greenwashing. They are not doing things. They are doing things. They are changing, right? The use of pesticides with Biological pest control, the use of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, petrol-based agrochemicals with uh, uh, organic fertilizers. They are using agrodiesel from palm oil in their tractors. Right, uh, this is a fix. Right, we are still talking about massive, but they are moving towards. The, they are doing soil conservation practices with all the superfluous biomass the branches, the stems of the cane leaves, right? They leave them there in the, fruit, in the, in the soil, right? To regenerate it. So I think they are quite far, you know, one or two or even three steps forward the debate. And yes, regardless of a fossil fuel free, we might still have this uneven concentration uh, uh, and uh, 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 corporate control in a green agri-food, global agri-food system, right? Or in a greener, good call, right? But it's still, yeah, to reinforce the fact that it's not mere greenwashing. There are changes, and I think it's very important for researchers, for people uh, uh, who is uh, actually concerned with dynamics of agrarian change to look into this, right? Not to disregard it as just corporate demagogy, but to see if there are changes and using now the flex crops, let's look also into, uh, you know, reforestation companies, mining companies. Are they doing something or not? Where, how? Yeah, that, that would be my opinion. Yeah, maybe I can add something to that. So what's actually happening now in places like Mato Grosso in Brazil is that they have a massive expansion of corn ethanol facilities. And... Um, so they are becoming like self-sustainable actually in the fuels. So they used to have their corn just as a, as, as a cover crop for soybean. And now they are installing these uh, 
con ethanol facilities and that's giving them actually like extra profits to expand to the Amazon and Cerrado because then they have the money and they are starting to use their machines with this locally produced corn ethanol, the large scale, like millions of hectares of soybean corn there. And they are also starting to use drones, large drones to spread the pesticides. So it's electrifying as well. So, so there's this electrification happening and they are aware of these like higher costs of fossil fuels. And, and, and the same with the bio, bio pesticides to, to get rid of the, you know, the, the dependence on oil in producing pesticides. So yeah, that's, and it's all part of this so-called more climate friendly, climate smart agriculture to get carbon credits with the, all those moves. So I think like uh, Alberto said, we are, they are ahead in that sense. That's of course not happening everywhere. So there would be major changes with the, and they are already now with the rising fossil fuel and then because of that like fertilizer prices, like now you see that there won't, won't be enough fertilizers to even in Europe because of, 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 of the energy cost, like the nitrogen production is heavily hit. Um, and then there's of course this development of biomass oils. Uh, I think that's, it's expanding very fast, like Finnish companies like, like Neste or, 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 or UPM, they are developing these wood-based or other material-based replacements for all kinds of stuff. So I would say that um, it might get worse in the post fossil fuel when you are like further expanding and getting the resources, not from the fossil fuels, but from actually from the land. Do you want to comment something? Always. No, <laughs> well, we're running out of the time. Just, uh, to, just to wrap it up or, or just, uh, I think there is, I agree with uh, Alberto and there is a lot of example like you said in near Brasilia there's this uh, sugarcane company they have 5,000 hectares of uh, bio sugar bio sugar plantation so no chemicals no uh, uh, chemical fertilizers no and they exporting everything to the United States uh, receiving double the price uh, for the sugar but then more than that they using the say the leftover from the sugar to fertilize the, the, the soil, but also they burning the acana, uh, the, the stems, the, the stems, yeah, the, uh, the, the bagasse, they, bagasse. they burning it, producing it electricity. So they are self-sufficient electricity. So they are making more money on that, but they also, they produce more electricity than, uh, than they need. So they selling to the municipality. And they put some machines that doesn't spell any gas. So then they are also selling carbon free things. So then it's a combination of, yeah, and it's sugar, monocro monocrop, 5,000 hectares. And, uh, and it's like example, it's a combination of greenwashing, but also beyond because they are more, more making more money because they not spending money in buying chemicals, they are producing it and so on. Okay, so then uh, I just want to give it, 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 we could move on and different examples, how they reproducing capital in a more or less unsustainable way. But still, of course, uh, a lot of problems and still the other characteristics like, you know, accumulation, depleting labor, depleting the nature in some way. And something we didn't mention here is very common that, you know, you, you just exhaust here and when it's done, you just move to someplace else and keep doing the same rationality. So, but, but it's still, I think they're trying because part of the survival of the capitalism in general, or part of important of reproducing capital and the way it's been done is to preserve some, some natural resources. So we can, you know, have people to, to, to uh, exploit the labor that have to nature to to reproduce the machineries and so on. But thank you for the opportunity. That's yes, please, Will and then Usman. And if you can come in front to, you can have, yeah, if you can come here so people can see you in the video. I, I, I think I, I think I think what you said. Okay, I'll stand really close to Sergio. Um, and actually this is a base, the question or the comment is something that Sergio said in the beginning uh, is part of the, the definition of, of agro-extractivisms and which connects with this sort of what you've just spoken 
with now is the, the issue of the productive activity or this productionism in agriculture. So maybe one of the keys going forward is, is this question of productivity or productionism that is, <clears throat> so I was in a, in a, a seminar several months ago with uh, a German university and a university in Tanzania. And that this was the issue was the, the green transition was to produce more biomass. And that was, and at the end of the seminar, everyone agreed that basically the problem is productionism is this productivist, uh, strategy that is at the heart of the green transition, which is still problematic because it's not going to actually, you know, extractivism lives on <laughs> through productionism, even if the methods become, you know, greener. So just, uh, to bring this up, maybe the panelists can discuss, talk a, a little bit more about this, this issue of productionism, productivist agriculture. Thank you, Will. Yeah. yeah next, Us Usman Astra. Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this, uh, very inspiring conversation here. Uh, my question is about like question of class that, um, Franklin mentioned, but also like actors in there, right? I mean, how do we operate, operationalize the concept of extractivism, for example, to understand the multiplicity of these actors and kind of overlapping of them, right? Not necessarily, for example, not as in black and white actors, like bad corporation, good community, but rather like, you know, this kind of in, entanglement of these actors with each other, right? And for example, like, um, if I could elaborate a bit on this, that like, for example, in Pakistan, like in one of the coal mine, which is part of this Belt and Road initiative, one of the biggest resistance that coming from the local communities is kind of spearheaded by the local politicians. Those politicians themselves are part of that elite or the powerful who at the first, at the, at, at the start kind of facilitated the whole process of that extractive kind of, uh, kind of, giving it legal and like, you know, this operationalizing the whole process there. So how we do kind of disentangle these kind of different, you know, uh, actors and their uh, activities. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And then we have a question from chat from Soledad Pass that, uh, um, so what alternatives do you envision? So maybe we make those three questions and you can, or is there somebody else from the audience who would like to ask a question? We have still 15 minutes. Yeah, please come here. And then you can already think about how you will respond. And I think we can wrap it up with this round of responses. So if you have anything to ask, please ask, ask it now. I'm taking the picture. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a really interesting discussion. Um, I, uh, in working a little bit more on, on food systems kind of more broadly, there's a lot of discussion about transitions that need to happen and everybody's all focused on transitions, but I don't hear enough discussion of extractivisms in particular agro extractivisms in the food systems transition literature. How do you see this work kind of getting its fingers into integrating kind of global food systems perspective, let's say, eat Lancet planetary health dietary guidelines, these sorts of things that don't really address this topic so well, I think. Uh, how could you imagine that we could do a better job there? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So maybe if Sana starts and then... Yeah, absolutely. I completely, completely agree with Will, as, as usually, with the whole idea of kind of that beyond just extractivism the the mindset there is very much just this productivist this kind of uh in like viewing the web of life instrumentally and and uh yeah the the for example in europe in eu the whole kind of greening measures the environmental regulations they're very very much still guided by this agro productivist mindset of how of new, of kind of noticing that okay yields are decreasing Soil is being contaminated, soil is degrading, or the material base of everything that is keeping this food system alive is being, uh, is, is, is about to collapse at some point. So how do we uh, make sure that we can still continue extracting, still continue uh, to kind of 
treat soils and land uh, as a pool of resources. And then these greening measures and environmental regulations and stuff like that has come into the picture. So yeah, so it has to be, it has to be kind of uh, also question this productivist mindset because in some ways uh, from the kind of political ontological multi-species perspective, uh, not, not much is produced, but rather transformed. So for example, the crops that are being grown are just kind of the life, the livability of the soil life, of sun's energy, of like all the, the kind of stuff that goes into the soil uh, is then just transformed into, into the, the grown crops. So it's not really produced per se, but transformed in a way. Uh, and then I loved Usman's question about the kind of complexity, the multiplicity of actors and agency and like that is so central because there also comes the question of what is extractivism because it's not just a project where you have extractivist people and non-extractivist people, but you can be part of a system, you can be practicing uh, you can be part of operations that are kind of like perpetuating extractivism in the web of life, even though that might come from the optionlessness that is like characteristic of your situation. So for example, farmers all over the world are kind of seeing this pressure from, from these political projects where you don't really have options, you don't really uh, because of corporatization of kind of uh, of agriculture, of food production, food prices have gone so down that farmers to be able to live and not go bankrupt, you have to take part in these these uh, uh, processes of mechanization or or uh, building efficiency and everything. So there, so but it's still 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 super important to really understand that there is this complexity of agency that you can't equate, for example, Monsanto buyer with the, with the farmer that is using Monsanto buyer's products. They're not the same. Uh, the, the accountability there is not the same. And Soledad's question about alternatives, really good. There's, I, I don't have any alternatives per se, me, but like there are many out there being practiced on different scales. Uh, not to say that they are the kind of like pure, what is the right kind of, what is then the, the final good uh, alternative, but the, the issue and the key there is in the plurality of the alternatives. Uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to be talking too much about that because, uh, but there's a bunch of people doing good stuff and a bunch of uh, resistance happening all over the world. Uh, yeah. And Rachel's question on on kind of how to bridge these conversations and that's got, I think that's the age old question in all sciences of how to how to bridge conversations that are not really happening uh, that are not being discussed uh, together and I think it just it yeah it starts from like I don't know everyday practices of kind of like. Uh, getting to know different conversations, taking part in them. But of course, in we are in this context where, where uh, academia is being neoliberalized and capitalized and you have uh, all these different pressures. But I think, I think it's the only way forward to bridge these conversations because the world doesn't happen in silos and these things don't exist in different sectors, but they're all, all connected. And yeah, there was a very funny joke from a friend of mine today of how agro-extractivism <laughs> <laughs> what, what does agro-extractivism say to different uh, sciences studying agriculture? Nothing, because they have been in silos. Yeah, good job, Will. Okay, that's me. <laughs> All right. Uh, very quickly, I hope we can also keep talking uh, beyond that, uh, also with those that are in the cyberspace or in somewhere beyond this room. I'm going to start backwards. Rachel, Rachel's question. Uh, he, I think, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you my two cents, but I'm also sending back the question to you as a scholar working on the food systems transformation. How can we bridge, right? So I think, uh, I think gradually, no, now reading quickly or re recalling Quickly, the discussions at the CFS, right? The 50 uh, recently, the, 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 the uh, 
uh, the World Security Council meeting, no, that meets uh, in Rome. Da, da, da. I think gradually there are in the side uh, discussions, right? Uh, especially with the confirmation of the high-level panel of experts and uh, who is there and who is not. There are, you know, the agrarian and food justice issues are converging gradually also from environmental and climate perspectives. I think uh, we, we tried uh, to start, start or, or we tried to contribute to these discussions uh, in 2014, in this uh, uh, critical colloquium or uh, colloquium on food sovereignty at Yale University, uh, and several special issues that came out of it, right? Uh, uh, particularly, I was involved, I guess, editing one for third world quarterly, in which, in which we actually tried to look into these challenges for the food sovereignty alternative regarding, yeah questions of resource property question, the rise of flex crops and commodities and commodities complexes as, you know, multi-purpose food, could be food, feed, biomaterials, bioenergy, right? Let's let's break the silo of those who work on energy, those who work on food. I mean, of course, this is now clear for everyone. We try to put this forward 2014, 2015. So, yes, coming from the agrarian side, I think uh, uh, this is a much needed uh, conversation, Rachel. Uh, quickly to Will's comment question, I I I, I agree. Uh, what is the point of greening uh, our food or materials production if we don't reduce actually the social metabolism of such production? In other words, if we do not change our consumption patterns, right? If we want to change a very energy efficient source fossil fuels with biomass, right? This is gonna be crazy. Still thinking of how many acres now planets do we need, right? To generate the same amount of food, energy, so on and so forth. So I think this is a question that comes, uh, yeah, to Soledad's that I will try to go uh, uh, quickly also, right? Alternatives, right? They, these alternatives, uh, well, particularly in Latin America, Soledad asks, and I would like to pick up on Franklin's comment, right? On, on the global issue, global interconnectedness, right? What happens in Latin America has to do, uh, at least since 530 years ago, a lot with what happens in Europe or in uh, let's say uh, the, the 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 world that is demanding, or the parts of the world that are demanding these uh, raw commodities, right? Uh, so to look at it in a more interconnected uh, fashion, uh, Soledad, I think that alternatives. To think of alternatives, I come back also to Mariana's comment. I think it's important to understand this agenda of the powerful. My two cents on this regard uh, have to do with an agenda, uh, uh, the, a political agenda, which is the political agenda of this oil palm and sugarcane flex crops and commodities that I called authoritarian corporate populism, precisely because, uh, yeah, uh, like in populist political regimes as usual, uh, these capitals uh, feed on the state, right? Conditional cash transfer, so on and so forth, to keep people alive, to feed people somehow, right? Uh, but then there are also these changes in the realm of private relations of production. Wage increases, uh, you know, changing forms of uh, uh, agricultural practices towards climate smart or sustainable intensification practices. Uh, so there are these uh, 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 important changes, right? Moving from land graphs, direct dispossession to ALS now working uh, contract farming arrangements. So we are not grabbing your land, yeah? To understand this political agenda. And to, uh, from that point onwards, Soledad, I think it's important then, of course, to pick Sana's uh, 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 response, no? How is this agenda being contested in different places? But I think it's important to build up the agenda, the, the, the alternative, the transformative alternative to understand well how power 
works, right? And not to imagine and not to keep saying, oh, this is how they always did it. Oh, yes, you know, greenwashing. But in real, I think it is important to understand why in Brazil, in Sweden, in Italy, it is working people voting, right? Uh, uh, yeah, right, extreme, right, wing uh, forces, right? Because they've been the in trade, right? Establishment, the neoliberal globalization of the last 50, 30, 40 years, depending when you want to start counting, left them not behind, left them underground, dead, sinking in the sea, right? So those are the important things. Perspectives, analytical perspectives, I think there are various, right? Eco-socialism, degrowth, uh, um, eco-feminism, environmental feminism. Yes, there are many isms around. So I think it is important to me, rather than just affiliating to one, see what works, where, where are the po political conditions for that to happen. And finally, talking about politics, Usman brings another fascinating, at least to me, methodological question. How do I make sense of this messy, complex, entangled politics, right? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, how do I do it, right? Well, I've been working uh, in the development of this multi-dynamic politics framework for the investigation of changing and generative politics between, across, and within actors or group of actors that are in challenging, supportive, or accommodative political standpoints with regard a particular distributional outcome of anything in particular, this mine, right? So how would I engage? Well, what is the position? Those are the challengers, the politicians. Okay, who else is, who is, who else is part of the opposition ranks and start understanding politics across them? That we can talk later. I think uh, I need to shut up. Yeah. Thank you, Alper. Right so, so we have one minute left. So maybe I think, sorry, Sergio, we cannot get to your answers, but... Uh, okay. But uh, Sergio will continue to speak one week from now at the Helsus presentation at 11 o'clock. So, so he will talk more in detail about his research and maybe you can re 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 respond to these questions also there. But I would like to thank all the participants and especially Alberto for coming to here all the way and everybody in the audience and in, in, in Zoom. So yeah, maybe Sophia, do you want to say? And the translators, yeah, wonderful. Thank you for your work. And uh, is there something else you would like to add? Maybe Sergio, I will give you the last uh, thirty seconds. No, just just thank you, Marcus, uh, <laughs> Sophia, Anya, uh, all the group of Exalt. That's been really nice uh, discussion. Thank you, the translator. Thank you, to you, uh, Marcus, uh, for the for the opportunity. Like I said, it was not rhetoric. I think it's part of our our work to kind of uh, moving forward in terms of our research, but also our engagement in this uh, this subject, because I think it's crucial. It's uh, very contemporary, but also very challenging in terms of academically, but also you know in our way of leading. So thank you for for having us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you.